Psalm 145 says, I will extol you, my God, O King, and I will bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you, and I will praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord, and highly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall praise your works to another and declare your mighty acts. Let's stand and declare them together. We are a sea of voices. We are an ocean of your praise. Gathered under one name. We are a tide that's rising. And we cannot be contained. You are like no one else. We thank you that we are redeemed and saved today. We proclaim together today that you are awesome. You are worthy. We love you. Let's sing this church. My God is awesome. My God is awesome. He can move mountains. Keep me in the valley. Hide me from the rain. My God is awesome. Heals me when I'm broken, strength where I've been weakened, forever He will reign. Sing that again. My God is awesome, He can move mountains, keep me in the valley, hide me from the rain. My God is awesome. Strength me when I'm broken, strength where I've been weakened, forever he will reign. Come on, sing it. My God is awesome, awesome. My God is awesome, he is awesome. Sing it. My God.
giver of salvation, by his stripes I am healed. My God is awesome, today I am born in From my sorrows to gladness, I have you. What more could I want? So raise my faith a little higher, set my spirit on fire. Lord, we're asking you to move. Cause you're the God of restoration, the one who gives salvation. Same God who he 
From my sorrows to gladness, I have you. What more could I want? Set my spirit on fire. No, we're asking you to move. Cause you're the God of restoration, the one who gives salvation. Thank you, choir. Would you be ready for that if God did it? I mean, what if revival just broke up and broke out? Are you ready to put your sail up and say, wind of God blow wherever you want us to go? That's what we got to be ready for. God's way, God's time. He's ready. We say, Lord, here am I whatever you desire. Well, I've been praying, asking God that he'd do that among his people. Amen and amen. We'll take your Bible and go to Philippians. We're in chapter 3. We'll begin reading verse 15, read through verse 21 this morning. For our friends over at Warrington, we're coming to see you tonight. And uh, we're going to have church tonight over on the Warrington campus. Hope you'll come. Uh, be there. Uh, we got lots of seats, and pray you'll come. If you be there, we'll have fellowship. They make an ice cream afterwards, so that some of you ought to come just for that. We'll have a great service over there tonight. I'll begin in Philippians chapter 4 over there this evening and pick up right where we'll leave off this morning. But uh, those on the Warrington campus, we love you. Thank God for you. We'll be preaching there tonight, so come join us uh, over there uh, tonight as we gather together 
on that campus where God's doing a wonderful, wonderful work. Well, I began reading this morning, Philippians chapter 3, beginning in verse 15, the message that I've entitled, Church Politics. Put your seatbelt on. <laughs> Let us therefore, as many as are perfect, have this attitude, and if in anything you have a different attitude, God will reveal that also to you. However, let us keep living by the same standard to which we have attained. Brethren, join in following my example and observe those who walk according to the pattern you have in us. For many walk, of whom I have often told you and now tell you even weeping, that they are enemies enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their appetite, whose glory is their shame, and who set their minds on earthly things. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which also we eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of his glory by the exertion of the power that he has even to subject all things to himself. For our citizenship, if you're reading a King James Version, it says our conversation is the translation there. Citizenship, conversation. Some people would translate this word, our commonwealth. The word, I've put this word up on the screen for you in its Greek spelling into English today. Politeuo. Our word politic comes right out of that word. Our word policy comes right out of that word. Our great Baptist word, polity, comes right out of that word. Our polity, our policy, our conversation, our commonwealth, our citizenship is in heaven. Amen. Now get the context here. Paul is writing from a Roman jail. To the church at Philippi. Philippi, according to Acts 16, is a Roman colony. They know about citizenship. They're not in Italy. They're in Greece. Yet they are a colony of Rome. What in the world does that mean? Well, it would take at least 300 people to have a Roman colony. You live outside of the city of Rome. You live outside of Italy. You live somewhere else. And the emperor says your city is a colony. They take a little bit of Rome and plant it well, there. Usually, it would be planted with retired military personnel drawing a stipend or retirement from Rome after having fought in the Roman wars across the world. And they took Rome to that region, and that's exactly what we have in Philippi. We have Roman citizens. Paul's a Roman citizen. Got him out of some trouble. But now he's in jail in Rome. His government locked him up. And he is saying, as a citizen of Rome, my citizenship, my politic, my polity is really not Roman, it's heavenly. Rome in this era ruled the world. Let me tell you a few things about Rome, and then we jump into this text. Five things about the Roman world. First of all, it's a world of peace. Pax Romana. For 200 years, Rome ruled the world. All around the Mediterranean, everything that touched the Mediterranean, Roman 
rule was there, and with their strength, they said there will be peace. <laughs> you raise your head, we'll cut it off. That was peace. <laughs> but they said, we, we're the big dog, and we're going to rule the world. And they did. It was called the Pax Romana. It was an imperial forced peace for 200 years. It was also a world of slavery. In Rome, 60, six out of every 10 people were in chattel slavery. They were owned by someone. It was a wicked world of slavery. It was a world, thirdly, of degraded religion. There were gods everywhere. Saturn, of course, was one of those. And everywhere you went, there was a god here and a god there and a god here and a temple there. And most of the temples included temple prostitutes where you would come for that kind of worship. It was such a degraded, godless religion. But it ruled Rome. Fourthly, it was a world of irreverence for human life. If a father did not like a child after it was born, he could, according to Roman law, kill the child. He could kill himself. He could just take it and set it on the side of the road for anything to happen. He could give it so a wild dog would come and destroy the child. Blood ran from the womb in this godless region. And it was also a world, number five, of brutalized lusts. They loved sport. Thus the Roman Colosseum. How many of you have been to the Colosseum in Rome? How many of you have been to the Colosseum? I've been there oh, more than once. Well, when you go to the Colosseum, if they let you, you walk down and your guide will point out the cages. The, the doors don't come down anymore. They're just open. But they say, you see right there? And they say, that's where the wild animals would come in. And say, what would they do? They would put people out. Irenus was the first. Irenus of Antioch. In 107 was the first. He was brought from Antioch. They put him into the Colosseum, and the wild beast came and devoured him, and the people roared. The gladiators would fight there. And when they would give them that thumbs down, they had sliced their head off. The people would roar. That was the culture of Rome. Sound like anything you see today? We have not gone to the depth, but we are on our way. You know what saves American culture from being the Roman culture? The remnant of God's people. Baby slaughtered by the million. We used to laugh at Saturday night wrestling. Then boxing. We've moved to MMA. You can find religion teach you anything in this country. In the middle of all of that, God planted a church called the Church at Philippi. Rome planted a colony. Listen to me now. Don't miss this. As Philippi was planted as a colony of Rome to carry the Roman message, 
The church today is a colony of heaven to carry Christ to the world. Our citizenship is in heaven. We are citizens, not first of this world, but of another world. And we have been planted here to carry the message of Jesus to a dark, difficult, depraved culture. Citizenship. I'm an American citizen. Just barely. I was born in Michigan. You just barely get in if you're <laughs> born in Michigan. I was born in Detroit. If you, if you take your compass and go due south from downtown Detroit, the first country you run into is Canada. You say, oh, that oh yes, it is right. Because Canada comes down and around there in Michigan. I ask that question to people and they say, Mexico? Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> Canada. You don't stay long, but it's there. been planning this message and little did I know that today would be the day that ICE would be rounding up illegal immigrants. And I've already offended some by just using that phrase. We live in such a, it's the meanest culture I've ever seen in our country. You can't even hiccup. Somebody will tweet you out. And so today, people that have broken the law are being arrested. And it, there's a way to fix all that, just nobody wants to fix it. It's just a political basketball is all it is. People bouncing it around. Uh, there's wickedness coming in. It, it's really not about people wanting to be citizens. It's about people wanting to make this nation what they want it to be. Now listen to me. Believers ought to be great citizens of their own sovereign nation. Yes, sir. You ought to be great citizens of whatever sovereign nation you are a citizen of. But you should also realize you're just a passing through and that you are citizens of heaven as well as citizens of Mexico, Canada, America, Romania. I love that nation. I'll be there next year preaching again. Notice a little Romanian girl won the Wimbledon yesterday in 58 minutes. I, I looked to see when it was on, and I said, well, in about an hour and 15 minutes, I'll turn over and see how it's going, and she was already holding up the deal. Some of my good friends over there are excited about a Romanian win. Well, it should. Yeah, and you take that, and it's wonderful. But listen to me now. Listen. Don't get caught up in that. We are God's colony. We are God's church. We are citizens of another world planted here for a little while and we are to live as heaven citizens preeminent to any other citizenship that you would have. Jesus first. So this text helps us see some things about our citizenship. I just want to give you five of them that are right here. As heaven citizen. Now, friend, if, if you're not saved, you're not heaven citizen. You're hell citizen. You're of another world. But if you're saved today, here's some things about your citizenship. Number one, we have a king. We have a king. The church bows to Christ alone. Verse 20 said, our citizenship is in heaven, from which also we eagerly await for a Savior, the Kyrios, the Lord, 
Jesus Christ. He is king. You bow to no one else. No one. Jesus is your king. Paul said in 1 Timothy 6 and verse 15, he is king of kings and Lord of lords. There's a song about that. We only do it at Christmas, but we ought to do it every Sunday. He's king of kings. Of all the kings, he's number one. Of all the lords, he's number one. That is our king. We have a king, and his name is Jesus. You bow to no one else like you bow to Jesus. As heaven citizens, we have a king. Secondly, we have a brotherhood. A citizenship, if you will. Verse 20 said, for our, that is all together, our citizenship, from which also we, we, plural, eagerly uh, await for a Savior. He talks about, verse 17 uh, tells us, brethren, join in following my example. We're brothers, we're sisters, we're citizens. It's ours, it's we, it's, it's us together. Look in verse 15. There are all kinds of citizens in the church. Notice Paul said, let us therefore as many as are perfect. All that are perfect, raise your right hand and say, I am perfect. Let me try it again. Everybody that's perfect, raise your right hand and say, I am perfect. <laughs> now, the word here is teleos, and it means mature. So everybody's mature, raise your right hand and say, I am mature. Now, my point is, we're in all stages of maturation. This young man I baptized today, he said he called his mother this morning. If I heard him right, he said, I called mother and I told her, I've been born again. And said, Mama, I was born one time with you. I've been born again. And he's seven days old. And he's, you grow rapidly when you're young. Man, he's growing. Thank God for what the Lord's doing in Brandon Sutton's life. You say, well, I bet he's got a past. Yeah, I bet you got one too. Everybody in here's got a past. Amen? But what God does, he, he grows us up, and we're in all stages in the church, toward, and we're all moving toward maturation, and that makes us a brotherhood. It's like a family. Like today, we're going to have lunch at, at my house. My mother says, she'll be there. She'll be the, the oldest person there. And then me and Liz and our children. In the grandchildren. And we're, we're in all stages of growth in age. But we're also in all stages of growth in spiritual maturation. That's the way a brotherhood is. It's the way the citizens are. It's the way America is. We, we got people in all stages. We got mature, constitutional, smart people, and then we got stupid people. And everything in between. We got people taking down the American flag, painting it and turning it upside down and raising a Mexican flag in its place. I tell you what, if you believe that, just drive down to NAS, go in the back gate because the only way you can get in and go down to the flagpole and take it down and put up a Mexican flag. Call me because I want to follow a hundred yards behind you. <laughs> it will not be pretty. And they will not speak Spanish to you when they explain to you. 
Number one, you'd never get the flag down, let alone another one put up. Do, do you understand what I'm saying? We, we got people all over the map, and they're that way. Listen to me, church. You, you're thinking about joining the church. You, you say, well, I'm going to come there because I like it. Let, let me tell you, we, we got those folks in, in this church that are not mature. They're selfish. They're, they're just small in their faith. And then we got folks that are great in their faith. They'll believe with God. And everything in between, that's the way the citizenship of the church is. We grow together, but with the goal of being perfect, teleos, mature, having this attitude. What attitude? The attitude of verses 13 and 14 that we preached about last Sunday, pressing on toward the goal of the high mark of the upward call. Well done. We have a king, we have a brother. Thirdly, we have enemies. Let me tell you, if you're, if you're in God's citizenry, you have enemies. He said in verse 18, 19, as many of us whom I have told you, I tell you even weeping that they are enemies of the cross of Christ. In verse number two of this text, he called them dogs. He, he called them evil workers. He told them those of the false circumcision. These are people who deny Christ, whose end is destruction. And many of these people were once in the church, and they were not really of us. Now they've gone out from us. Uh, I read this week on Facebook, and you know it's true. Uh, a young lady that was raised in the church, and she She'd say she believes in God, but she's left the church. Her phrase was, uh, uh, I'm having trouble because my, my parents raised me in a Baptist barn. And she didn't mean their house, she meant the church. And she's gone away from the church. Uh, college stole her faith. That's why next Sunday night I'm, I'm inviting you to join me at 5.30 out in the Corners building. Just drop by for a few minutes. I'll be there from 5.30, about 7 o'clock. Just come in. We want to pray next Sunday night. I'm not having church here, but next Sunday night we meet out. Just drop by and get on your knees in that building with me for a few minutes and pray for God to send revival among college students. We'll be out there 5.30. Till 7 o'clock, I'll be there. I'll pray with you or somebody else will. Just come in. It's very uh, informal. Just come by, get on your knees for a few minutes or stay the whole time. I don't care. We're just going to pray. We're not there to gossip or talk or whatever. We're just going to come pray for a few minutes and ask God to do a work among us. Why? Because there are enemies, enemies all around us. They deny Christ. Their end is destruction. Their God, this text says, is their appetite. That is their sensual indulgences. Their glory is their shame, just how shameful they can be. And their mind is not set on things above. The Word of God says their mind is set on earthly things. We have enemies. The church has enemies. Well, every sovereign nation has enemies. Evidently, the Russians don't like America. They want to vote. They, they must like us. I don't know. They want to vote in your place. There are enemies on every side. The Iranians, the North Koreans. They're enemies to a sovereign state. But let me tell you, they're enemies to the citizenship of Jesus. They den when they deny Christ, they are not your friends. They are your enemies. They're your mission field, but they're not your friends. They're your enemies. I was looking on my wall over there this morning. There's an article that uh, was in the editorial section of the Pensacola News Journal years ago when we started Ministry Village at Olive, and uh, they drew a cartoon uh, about us, and it was all very positive. It had Jesus weeping, and he was pleased with what we were doing and starting the Ministry Village, and and I, I, I read through that this morning looking again. I'll never forget, I called the editor of the paper that afternoon when it came out. It was so positive. We couldn't bought that kind of uh, press for, you know, thousands and thousands of dollars. And uh, I called him and uh, uh, I said, I just want to thank you for uh, the article and for that. And he said, well, Pastor, you're welcome. And, and then, and forgive me, I'm going to tell you just exactly what he said. He said, listen, you, you've done a good thing, and he wrote it, but by God, if you do bad, I'll write that too. That was his word to me. 
And I backed up and I thought, he ain't my friend. He said, when I see news, I write it. If it's good, I write that. If it's bad, I write that. My prayer from then to now has been stay out the news journal. I don't want to rise to that headline. Hmm. Listen to me, friend. The church is a citizenship of heaven, and we have enemies that deny the cross of Christ. And if they're not on Jesus' side, they're not on your side. Doesn't mean you don't love them. Doesn't mean you don't befriend them. Doesn't mean you try to win them. But you be very careful when dealing with your enemies. Number four, not only have we got a king, we have a brotherhood, we have enemies, we have a motto. Yes, amen. Every nation has a motto, and we have one at the church of the living God, and our motto is this, Jesus Christ is Lord. Say it with me. Jesus is Lord. One more time. Jesus is Lord. We find it right there in verse number 20. The Lord Jesus Christ. That's the motto of the church. Jesus is Lord. And if he's the Lord, he's commissioned us. He's commissioned us to go and tell. Our job is to go and to tell. Who's your one? Who's your one? We're asking that question. Everybody teaches a Sunday school class. I'm asking you to teach this material. In the month of August, coming up here, about three weeks we'll start and asking everybody for a month to teach the material. Who's your one? If your Sunday school teacher's not going to teach that, ask them why. Said the pastor asked you to do it. Let's just get on the same page for evangelism during August. All of us together answering the question, who's your one? Then mark your calendar for October 13, on Sunday night, I, I'm praying we have 2,000 people at least in this building. On Sunday night, October 13, Dr. Johnny Hunt will be our preacher. He is the one uh, who is working now for the North American Mission Board, uh, and he is the one who is spearheading Who's Your One, and he's agreed to come here, and he's going to train us and teach us how to share our faith on October 13. After we go through August and get our training, then six weeks later when Dr. Johnny comes, man, you ought to be here to hear that Indian preach. It, it'll be a great night. He said, Preacher, you can't say that. Well, I just did, and I'll say it again if I want to because what he says about himself, all right? It, it, this is the most thin-skinned culture I've ever been around in my life. I could have sued people for what I was called as a kid. <laughs> Carrot top, red on the head. I got about 15 of them. Seven of them I can't say in here. A little humor goes a long way. Kind of takes a little bit. That's why you got to get serious, but it's okay. Humor will bring some of that down. Jesus is Lord. We have a motto, and we've been commissioned to go and tell. Friends, we've already spent half of this year living. Have you, as a member of the church, shared the gospel? Have you invited anybody to your church in the first six months? I just wonder, are you really a citizen? Your king told you to go. I wonder, are we in submission to the king? We have a king. We have a brotherhood. We have enemies. We have a motto. And number four, five, we have a future. Hallelujah for the future. Do you know for a colony of Rome, the highlight of their existence would be that the emperor would come for a visit. What if the king came? Son, they'd shine every piece of gold they had. They'd clean everything. They'd be ready, 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 ready when the emperor came rolling into town. All was made ready. It'd be the greatest event in Philippi if the emperor came. Verse number 20 says, we're waiting eagerly for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. He's coming. Who'll train when he comes? He's going to transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of his glory. Right now, we're in humility. Uh, Right now, we walk in the flesh. But I'm telling you, we're going to walk in glory because he's going to transform us by the exertion of the power that he has even to subject all things to himself. Oh, he has power. 
And he's going to change us because he's coming again. When's the last time you've been to the cemetery and stood by the shoulder of somebody weeping, burying their loved one? I spoke to one of our men today, flowers here in honor of his daughter. I said, I know it's a tough day. She died early. She'd be in her 50s now. He said, you know, Pastor, I've told people as I'm sitting by my wife that I have a reason to stay here because of my wife, but I also have a reason to go there, my little girl. Amen? Aren't we all there? We have reasons to stay, all oh, but a reason to go because we have people on the other side. It's a hard day when you send them on to the other side. But one day the king's coming. He's going to change us. He's going to change us from our frail humanity. And we're going to be made like unto his glory. That's what he said. The year was 1899. You remember 2000 came? How the world was waiting for all the computers to blow up? I don't know what they were waiting on to blow up in 1899, but they were waiting on something. Some of y'all come by and tell me how it was after the service. <laughs> the year was 1899. Two men that were known all across the world died that year. First, Robert Ingersoll died. taught at Harvard. You can go online and listen to him if you want to. The Ingersoll lectures are given. You don't want to listen. They are godless. They are anti-Christian. They tear down everything that you stand for if you're a citizen of heaven. Ingersoll died that year. And when he died, history accords that his family was in shock because he was in panic mode knowing death was around the corner. They had him cremated and held on to his ashes for days not knowing what to do. There was absolutely zero, none, no hope for another world. It was in that same year in 1899 that Dwight L. Moody died. He was that ignorant, unlearned man that got saved and torched the world with the gospel. Moody Church today in Chicago bears his name. Moody Bible Institute bears his name. Moody had been sick for weeks. History records his daughter came by and prayed over him, said, Father, spare my daddy. Spare my daddy. And she writes that Moody touched her and said, Sweetheart, don't pray that. He said, and I quote, Earth is receding. Heaven is opening. God is calling. Do not ask the Father to keep me here. I've been inside the gate, sweetheart. I've seen the faces of the children. Don't ask God to bring me back here. And Moody slipped into the next world. Being dead, yet he lives. Saturday, Friday it was. I was uh, at home taking a little time just to rest. I'd been a little weary. Liz left, and 
I had a book I was reading, and it was just falling apart. It's an old, old little paperback, and it, I read it many times. And, and I thought, I'd like to have a new copy of that. And I could go online and get it, but I'd like to have one right now. So I thought, where's a bookstore? There was not one. And then I thought, Peter Ruckman has got a bookstore right down the road from my house. So I got in my daddy's truck, and I went over to the Bible Baptist bookstore, put on a mustache, (laughs) pulled my hat down, and I kind of sauntered in have some great product in there. It's not the first time I've gone undercover. (laughs) I didn't have the book I wanted, but I just prepared this message, and there was a little pamphlet there, cost 75 cents. It was by R.A. Torrey, entitled, Why God Used D.L. Moody. I bought that in another book. And so I got home and I began to read through why did God use D.L. Moody? Just a little 15-page pamphlet. The great R.A. Torrey, who really carried Moody's shoes for years, wrote about what he saw in this great man of God. And he talked about all kinds of things. He said he was a great, deep man of prayer. He said he was a man who made a commitment never to go to bed that he hadn't spoken to someone about Jesus one time every day in his life. Told two stories of how he got up during the night because he had not talked to anybody, he'd forgotten about it, and he just went out and walked the street till he found somebody. He had made a commitment to talk about Jesus to someone every day of his life. He began to talk about the fullness of the Holy Ghost. And then he talked about humility. He said, it's the most humble man I'd ever known in my life. He said, you'd have to force him to the front. He he just bowed before God and, and asked for power. Olive family, we need to learn again to bow before God and ask for power. That's what citizens do. 